are in listen only mode. Hello and welcome. If you will give me one second. Hello, I'm Barbara Levin, the Executive Director of Neurofibromatosis Mid-Atlantic. Welcome to Neuropsychological Functioning in Neurofibromatosis. I want to thank you all so much for joining us for this very exciting and informative program. We're very happy to be sponsoring this educational event. Because we have some folks joining us today who are hearing impaired, I've written down my opening and closing remarks. We will provide a closed caption version as soon as possible. NF Mid-Atlantic is a nonprofit organization based in Baltimore. We've been around for 34 years and we remain committed to our founding principles of supporting people with NF, their families, their caregivers, their circles, and anyone who has an interest in NF. A few housekeeping items. There is a question pane on the right side of your, of your screen. If you have questions during the presentation, simply type in your question and, send, and click send. At the end of the presentation, we will do a question and answer session and take as many questions as time permits. I will be muting everyone while Dr. Kuvadeli speaks, but feel free to write your questions. By December 8, 2012, this presentation will be available in its entirety for reviewing. Simply visit our website at www.nfmidatlantic.org to view this. We will also have archived webinars available. You may also go to our YouTube channel at Great Gabby Dog to view all our video presentations. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my... We are so honored to welcome Dr. Barbara Cuvadelli, MD, PhD. She is a pediatric and adult clinical neuropsychologist who focuses on the assessment and treatment planning of a wide spectrum of neurological and neurodevelopmental conditions that can negatively impact an individual's life at different developmental stages. Dr. Kuvadeli's unique background in both medicine and psychology enables her to better understand an individual's current level of cognitive, psychological, and adaptive functioning. What we hope to accomplish today is to provide important information for patients, parents, and caregivers of people with neurofibromatosis based on, our, on current clinical research findings and clinical experience. She will focus on different domains of cognitive functioning and how they are affected with patients with neurofibromatosis. Dr. Kuvadeli is an avid researcher, teacher, and writer. She has offices in New York City and New Jersey. Before we start, I'd like to remind everyone that NF Mid-Atlantic survives solely on your donations. If you appreciate these educational webinars, and clearly 140,000 people from over 62 countries do, and we want you, them to, and you want them to remain free, please consider a donation in any amount. You may do so at www.nfmidatlantic.org. We are a tax-exempt 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we've made donating very easy. We will soon be announcing an entire slate of new webinars for 2013. In order to make sure you're informed of the schedule, make sure you are on our mailing list. You can sign up at our website, again, www.nfmidatlantic.org. If you will please indulge us for one moment while I turn this webinar over to Dr. Kuvadeli. Thank you again so much. Dr. Kuvadeli, you are all set. Okay. You can see my screen, correct? I hope so. So, um, just yes? a moment. Yes, we can. Okay, great. 
So today we're going to talk about the neuropsychology of neurofibromatosis. I'm not going to talk too much about the genetic parts of it because I believe that you already had some information in those areas, but I'm going to skim it through a little bit. Um, so for um, let's focus first on the NF1. Uh, it's a tumor disorder, as you all know, that is caused by a malfunction of a gene on chromosome 17 that is responsible for the control of cell division. Um, so what happens basically, we'll have like different tumors throughout the body. Um, we don't know exactly where they're going to be manifesting. So we can also have problems with the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. And that's why many times we may have problems with uh, neuropsychological um, uh, functioning. Um, it is also believed that um, there are some uh, ways that the brain has been organized early on during development that may not be optimal and that's another reason why we may have some neuropsychological problems with um, uh, individuals who have NF1 or NF2. That's why many times we can have like you know some symptomatology such, such as microcephaly or there are different like you know areas of the brain that they actually are lighting up in a T2 weighted uh, tomography, which is magnetic resonance uh, imaging. Um, we still don't know exactly uh, why um, all those, um, how it, it's really like impacted the neuropsychological functioning, but we are um, um, really like projecting on different theories. So um, the instance of NF1 is one in 35 live births, so um, we it is a pretty common condition. However, I have to say that the ex expressivity is very variable, which means we cannot predict what would be the problems in each individual that has a, a, a neurofibromatosis. And so we will see, we will start like checking children like early on during their developmental stages, we may find different like you know combination of symptomatology or we may not find any symptomatology. So uh, usually 50% of the cases that we see may have some problems, um, but it, that could be higher also, it could be lower. So the NF2 is a little bit more rare and is a mutation in a different gene, which is the uh, gene 22. But again, you know, the defect is in the tumor suppressant uh, factors. Now, I'm going to start with explaining what is neuropsychology, what is a neuropsychological assessment, what a neuropsychologist does is trying to figure out the functioning of the brain. So the neurologist is going to focus on different structural abnormalities of the brain, and the neuropsychologist is going to correlate those abnormalities, if there are any obvious ones, to the brain functioning. So we are very much aware of how the brain works or, or the structure of the brain, but also we have to know how the, the, the brain um, uh, functions. So if you, you're trying to see different areas, such as like, you know, the IQ, intellectual abilities, um, attention, memory, executive functioning, as well as psychological functioning. So in regards to, I will focus more on NF1 uh, on this presentation because NF2 does not have a lot of research. Um, it's, there is not a lot of research in the field. However, there, uh, the, based on the research that is out there, there are similar neuropsychological profiles that we'll find in both uh, conditions. So um, I'll start with the IQ, which is intellectual um, functioning. And unfortunately, in early studies, and a lot of physicians may still have that idea that a lot of individuals with NF1 may uh, be mentally deficient. And uh, that uh, percentage was pretty high early on, it was 43%. Now we know that only 4 to 8 percent of the population will have um, an IQ lower than 70. Now, the average IQ is 100 plus or minus 15. So um, 70 and lower is, um, is uh, uh, considered impaired. Now, 
what we usually though find is that the full scale IQ of patients with NF1 ranges from 89 to 98, which is actually considered to be in the low average and average range. So if you uh, can notice here that we just have like you know individuals that do can function fine in everyday life, or if they do have that IQ, and only a very small percentage may have like more severe problems. However, what has been found, like you know, throughout the literature, is that even though children with NF1 they usually score within the average range, they do score lower than their siblings without the NF1. So those individuals, like you know, they, the siblings are used as controls to compare, like the two, uh, you know, the ones that are affected and the ones that they are not affected, and the difference usually is around. Uh, 5 to 15 points um, lower than their uh, siblings that they are not affected. So there is something there uh, that um, is going on consistently. So we do see like a little bit like lower IQs when we compare with uh, their siblings. Now, you probably heard a lot about learning disabilities. The issue here is that we cannot say that there is a learning disability fed Type, which means that there is not a specific profile that we find in kids or individuals who have NF1. So we can find different like problems in learning, ranging from written language, reading accuracy, which is phonological decoding, comprehension, spelling, or math. So again, based on like you know the specific like you know brain functioning of the individual with NF1, we have to see what are the specific learning problems that that the, the individual we have and take it from there. But overall, there is like between 30 to 65 percent of individuals with NF1 that they will exhibit some learning problem um, in, um, in school. So, um, now, most children with NF1 do display reading, spelling, and arithmetic problems. Uh, later on, they also find that even though the um, reading, spelling, and arithmetic problems get better because there are accommodations given in the school for those children, we still find that there may be some um, problems that they are you know, long-lasting. Now, um, one of the things that has been shown into the literature throughout studies is also that individuals that they have NF1 and NF2, they do have some problems with visual spatial ability. Usually that um, area, of, the area of, of the brain that is like responsible for that is the parietal occipital temporal lobes on the right hemisphere. Um, they have found that one consistently like uh, test, uh, one test that consistently like you know uh, individual score, score lower is the judgment of line orientation test. So if you ever have a neuropsychological evaluation, that test for sure needs to be administered in order to see um, if there is any problem in that area. Now we also find that individuals with uh, the condition will have problems with copying complex designs, constructing patterns with blocks, or assembling puzzles. And I see a lot of kids that they may have um, issues with that which will translate into the classroom of copying like you know things from the board or being able to like uh, use like different things into the classes that they use uh, they need like visual spatial deficits and that's a very important area that needs to be accommodated uh, for a child that um, has like NF1 and NF2. Now, many times, like you know, early on, again, they believe that the language skills of individuals with NF1 or NF2 are more intact. However, you know, it has been found that 26% of children that they have the NF1 and NF2 have both expressive and re receptive language deficits. Again, we cannot say that like this is like the only like you know expressive or um, or a receptive language deficits uh, one, two, three. That's what we are seeing as a profile but the areas that they may have problems would be the fluency, which means like I want, I'm going to tell you like um, a category and I want you to come up with as many words as you can. For example, tell me as many animals as you can. 
and you ask like the child and the individual to tell you as many items in that category, and they may have problems coming up with um, you know um, a lot of items under each category. Um, again, like you know, this it, it, it translates in different areas of the brain that I'm not going to go over, but you know, um, it's more like frontally oriented, like or temporally oriented, like you know, these uh, areas that they have been affected. So. The other area that may be like uh, that is language and um, the affected is the naming. So you are going to tell someone, I want you to tell me how this is called and they may have problems coming up with a name as fast as someone else. Um, and uh, we call that dysnomia. So um, um, again, like, you know, when a child may have this type of difficulty in class, they will require more time to be given to them in order to come up with the same um, to the correct word or they will need cues so they can uh, assist them to come up with the, uh, you know, the correct word. Um, phoneme uh, segmentation, that will affect a lot of the reading and phonologic memory, like remembering like how words look and, uh, and that will also affect like, you know, the, um, the spelling. So. Um, other areas that we find that kids have problems with NF1 is um, actually motor coordination. They may be okay with fine motor skills that they have to do with simple tapping um, uh, and uh, their speed in that might be fine. However, when they have to motor coordinate different uh, you know, uh, motor functions, they may have more problems. Um, they may have also problems with writing, and we call that dysgraphia, and they will need more time, for example, to uh, write in cursive or like, um, you know, put things in certain like uh, slots in a very fast manner. So they may need like a, a lot more time to uh, conduct those kind of um, tasks. They may have problems with balance and hand-eye coordination. Again, you know, it depends from the, the individual. So every individual will have to have a specialized neuropsychological evaluation in order to figure out which are the areas of strength and weaknesses, and then a treatment plan needs to be developed in order to address those uh, uh, more like um, deficient areas. Now, uh, many individuals from the group, I'm sure they are interested in the attention and executive functioning uh, domain. And uh, there is a reason for that because 33 to 50 uh, percent of children with neurofibromatosis um, uh, are um, having attention problems. And they are more, uh, three times more likely than their unaffected siblings to be affected by some type of attention issue. Now, the, there is a high comorbid, comor, comor, comorbidity between ADHD and NF1, which means like they will have both disorders, which means they will be diagnosed with NF1 and then they will qualify for the criteria of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, usually the inattentive type, and I'll go over with that. With that. I'll explain more what is that. So uh, there are different like types of ADHD. Uh, there is the uh, ADHD um, hyperactive type. There is the ADHD primarily hyperactive type, primarily inattentive type, and, and the ADHD that is combined type. The children that are usually um, having um, NF1 and NF2, they will be diagnosed with the primarily inattentive type. However, even if they are not fulfilling the criteria for an attention disorder, they will display some attention-related symptomatology. So they will have some problems with sustained attention usually and planning. So again, even if they don't have the added diagnosis of ADHD, they will still, we still find that they do have problems with sustained attention and planning. Now, with executive functions, what is executive functions? Um, it's more like, you know, the area of the brain, which is like the frontal lobes that is involved in thinking, problem solving, reasoning, planning, cognitive shifting, basically what makes us human. You know, this is like the area of the brain that is very well developed in human beings and differentiates, and differentiates us from other, you know, lower um, animals, like um, uh, species. So, 
What we find in uh, individuals who have neurofibromatosis is that they may have problems with inhibition, uh, working memory, and cognitive fle flexibility. What do we mean by inhibition? When you are, for example, bombarded with different like um, uh, problem-solving strategies, and there are like you know one more prominent than the other, many times like you know individuals uh, who have inhibition problems, they cannot like ma make uh, the decision of like suppressing one um, solution and go with the other solution or if they just see like something that is very prominent in front of them they may be a little bit impulsive and they are not able to inhibit um, their response to, um, to the immediate response to the environment. So one problem is with inhibition, the other one is working memory. What is working memory? Working memory is when I would tell you like a phone number and you have to remember that phone number in your, um, you have to remember that uh, phone number without like, you know, me telling you again. Um, you, I could tell you some numbers and you have to manipulate it in your brain. For example, if I'll tell you like three, four numbers and I want you to tell me those numbers uh, backwards. So when you have to hold information in your brain and manipulate it or even remember it, that is called working memory. So individuals who have and F1 and then F2 may have in, uh, problems with working memory. Now, what is cognitive flexibility? Cognitive flexibility is when you have to shift paradigms from one task to the other in a, in a, a, a fast manner. So, for example, you know, we give some tasks um, in, in, um, during testing that will say, you know, I'll give you some numbers and letters and I want you to uh, connect all the numbers um, and the letters in an ascending manner. So, you have to connect, like, you know, the first, like, the letter, then the number. And you have to keep in track of um, which number and which letter you need to connect and also shift from the number to the letter. That's one of the tasks that we give. But in everyday life, it could be that a, a, lot, a lot of things need to be done and they, you need to multitask. And like individuals who have NF1 or NF2 might have trouble shifting from one task to the other in a fast and efficient manner. So um, the other areas that we find that they may have problem with um, is uh, planning, problem solving, um, ab abstract formation and reasoning. Uh, not everybody will have all these executive function deficits, of course, but again, like, you know, you, if you see, we do see them more prominent individuals uh, that they have NF1 and NF2. So, um, as I said before, like, you know, inhibition is one of the ones uh, symptoms that we find, and it's the, one of the most frequently demonstrated executive functioning deficits we find in um, NF1. Uh, that will also affect like, the attention of the individual because many times they will be very impulsive and will not be able to stop like you know a reaction they have to an environmental stimuli. So. Um, let me see. Now, I wanted to also talk about remediation strategies for uh, individuals um, and uh, that they may like experience some of the problems. And I focused more on the kids. So, um, but those strategies can also be used by adults. Again, like I am. I will always suggest that you, uh, if you haven't had a neuropsychological evaluation for your child or yourself, to do so and find out what are your strengths and weaknesses. And basis, based on those, then a very specialized um, a treatment plan can be developed. And there are specialists for cognitive remediation that they could assist you or your child in order to achieve optimal levels of functioning in uh, each area of um, um, weakness. So these are overall strategies that they may not be for everybody. So let's say that like you know a child may have attention or like an individual has attention concentration strategies. How can we like help the child? For example, like you know, I always say that the child needs to be sat in the front of the class. Information needs to be modified so it's not overwhelming and it needs to be broken down into smaller chunks. So they are able to focus on the information without being overwhelmed and overstimulated. And if there is a lot of visual stimuli, especially 
with uh, individuals who have visual spatial difficulties, it's better if you the uh, stimuli on a piece of paper or whatever like you know the person is focusing on is reduced and the information like would be color coded like or you know use a uh, different strategies such, such as highlighters to make sure that the information that needs to be learned or be focused on is popping out of the page. And it's very important that like you know the environment uh, is um, designed in a way that doesn't cause a lot of distractions. So uh, if they say that we have a, a child, you know, I would dedicate a space that it doesn't have anything else on it but the uh, study materials of the individual, or, like work materials of the individual, and try to just like make sure that there are not anything, um, any other extraneous stimuli that will distract that uh, uh, the person. The other um, um, important uh, strategy is to always focus and have a routine. Um, so if the child learns that there is a certain routine for um, homework, they will learn how to do it and they will get used to, uh, the, to that routine without being overwhelmed. Um, if the individual or the person, like the student, has a lot of attention problems, then I would suggest that you develop, like, you know, a plan with the school so the assignments are shortened, and um, also, like, you know, the teacher or you can give some subtle cueing to make sure that they are on the same page uh, that they need to be. Um, again. And one of the very important uh, things that someone needs to do early on is to make sure that the student or the individual gets accommodations in the school. Um, the, it is considered like a, um, a condition that can uh, be uh, classified. Um, so if kids like um, have NF1 or NF2, they can be classified in school and receive like accommodations for the strengths and weaknesses. I would just uh, strongly suggest that this is done very early on. So they, the, in the school environment, the academic environment, or even the work environment has to be something that is uh, friendly and conducive to growth rather than being seen as an ad adverse environment that um, the child doesn't want to be in. So. A communication strategies, again, you know, if um, the uh, individual or the child has communication um, issues and language issues, I would see what they are, but like many times what we can do is uh, limit the, the amount of information that we give to the child at a specific time, use concrete languages, a language um, preferential seating again, like you know, or, you know, in the front of the class would be better. Many times when I go and observe kids, they do have them in the front of the class, but they do have them next to a heater or maybe like next to the door, which defeats the purpose. So it's very important that the teachers know what it means to um, to have someone in preferential seating and and make sure that. The main goal there is to reduce auditory distractions, just rather than changing positions in the class. Um, the, to avoid rapid rate of speech, it depends from the child. Again, if they do have receptive language difficulties, then I would um, talk to them in a slower pace. However, if they don't, you know, um, that wouldn't be necessary. And active listening strategies is um, have the student and the individual paraphrase what they heard. Ask them like well, after you, you know, the teacher or you are said you say something to the child or the individual, you ask them to tell you back what they understood. Many times kids will say that they did understand what you said, but they may have not paid attention to it, or they did not like fully understand the whole message of what you're trying to convey. Now the visual processing strategies, um, again, th those could be like reducing amount of visual stimuli on the page, use a ruler or a note card for visual tracking, uh, use hours or color dots for queuing, block off parts of the page not in use, and how you would do that is take like a piece of paper, cut out a rectangular piece on the upper um, left side. Um, that will be like for the biggest work you can 
have and then like you know block the rest of the page so the child focuses on each word at, um, at a time so they don't get overwhelmed and if they do have reading problems that will help them not uh, get skip any words or you know focus on the whole word rather than like you know half of the word so um, supplement visual with verbal and hands-on things like multi-sensory teaching strategies um, is, are the best. So if um, a child learns better with visual, then visual is better. Um, if the child learns with verbal, verbal is better. Tactual. So whatever it needs to be like uh, um, presented in different formats, I would do that. You know, I would not relay or rely on one uh, visual, uh, one, on one like, you know, sensory modality rather than uh, in multi-sensory uh, modalities. And especially with the individuals who have NF2, like the tactual like modality has to be also addressed and many things need to be given in that also. Um, I would adjust with visual field cuts if there are any. Uh, or if um, um, the kids may have problems with convergence, which means like you know they cannot focus on one uh, single word on the page, I would uh, have make sure that they have a neuro ophthalmological uh, examination and an examination from a neuro optometrist because they may need prisons and that may like you know help them like converge onto the page easier and make reading um, reading a lot easier than uh, what they may be experiencing. Um, I would suggest that the viewing time of um, stimuli needs to be longer. So if like um, a child needs to um, read like a piece of you know, a big book, I would just like to make sure that they do have a longer time to process the visual information. And I would have everything in a in a in the enlarged print making sure that um, they are able to see it and also there is less information on a page. Usually we don't find like you know memory uh, difficulties with the individuals who have NF1 on NF2, but if there are any, and occasionally we may find some, uh, then um, devices such as memory book or electronic organizer, or calendar, list and checklist, which are very good for executive functioning also, we would use those. Uh, a homework book, uh, watches, timers, uh, notes, a daily schedule, an audio recorder. These are all strategies that they can use for memory, but also for executive functioning. So um, this way that individuals can learn to have like a routine and use like also different um, modalities in order to um, accommodate them. Now with our organization effects, uh, the main thing that I also say except from that is um, self-talk strategies. Self-talk strategies are uh, actually providing the external flowchart initially for having like you know the organization that someone needs in order to navigate the task. So many times when we are not sure of what we're doing, we'll, you will notice that we are using overt self-talk. So they're going to say, okay, I don't know what I'm doing here. I think first I'm going to push the button then, and you'll just notice that we are like saying that allowed. After like, you know, a task becomes more automatic, we will use covert, internalized self-talk. So a lot of the kids that they do or like individuals who have problems with the organization or they may have problems with problem solving, they will need to be talk self-talk strategies. Um, first, you're going to like break down the task into different like steps, and you're going to go over with the child and the individual like all those specific um, you know sub uh, uh, subtasks, and then you are let, uh, you are going to ask them to repeat them, um, and um, um, eventually they'll be able you will be able to give them a task and they'll be able to do it by themselves. So um, now based on our um, slide here, um, they may have problems, like let's say that we have a child that is um, has NF1 or NF2, they might have problems with organization effects, um, and they may have difficulty getting all of the materials needed for a class or homework, they might have like problems telling a story in its correct sequence, uh, poor organization of notes, notes 
you know, et cetera. So what do we do? We can have like a notebook or graphic organizer. Um, uh, I would just suggest that like if the, the individual is a student to have a big notebook with all the different like you know sub tests, uh, sub like you know subjects and they can be color coded or being in uh, colored folders for different subjects. Um, I would make sure that the teacher gives like study sheets and guides and I would just, if the individual is um, not a student, I would just suggest that um, if they need to uh, learn something new, they need to actually like break out the tasks into simpler uh, sub um, tasks and learn them um, slowly and very, um, um, a very in a very organized manner. Um, if there is external help, that would be great. But sometimes they may not be. So uh, individuals need to learn how to do that by themselves. Um, if there are kids, like queuing is very important. How to organize the notebooks and backpacks, checklists, etc. Now. Um, for reasoning, as I said before, that we might have problems with reasoning, abstract thinking strategies. Um, always, like you know, have the child or the individual ask, you know, why, what, when, where. Um, the why and how questions are, are usually like the most difficult ones. But what um, happens is like you know, if you are working with an individual who has trouble, with those two questions like those can be practiced and they can be rephrased and then eventually as I said like using self-talk strategies that children or the individuals can learn how to answer those questions too and use them as flow charts in writing in like talking and speaking or um, in any other task that we may be doing. Um, Again, like you know, avoid open-ended questions and actually model abstract thinking techniques, the ones that we said about self-talk. Now, um, the other techniques that can be used is like divergent and convergent thinking skills. What are those? Uh, when you have a problem and you are telling the individual to come up with as many uh, problem-solving strategies as they can, this is using divergent thinking skills. So you are coming up with as many solutions to a problem that's divergent. Then you are telling the individual to order those um, problem-solving solutions according to important, uh, which is the most important one. The, when you are doing that, you are using convergent thinking skills. So you first come up with all the um, uh, solutions to a problem, and then you are ordering based on what is the most optimal solution to the problem. So divergence is like all the solutions, convergence is like come with the best solution. The self-talk strategies, as we talked about, uh, brainstorm alternatives. Uh, it's very important to brainstorm and just teach like the individual to do that on a regular basis. Usually, we are um, we are like, we tend to go from A to C uh, through a certain like route. So, uh, with brainstorming, the individual can learn like how to follow different routes in reaching like a, um, a, a solution or um, a result. So um, when we use a problem solving model, you, it's very important that um, you define the problem, you generate the solutions, look at pros and cons for a solution, solution and check results to see which solution is more uh, viable. I'm sorry about that. I think it's too big here, but that's right. So uh, in regards to testing modification, um, extended time or breaks um, for attention are necessary when a child has attention problems or have executive uh, uh, function difficulties. Uh, make sure that you provide a word bank or fill in the blank questions. Uh, permit alternative means of testing or written nonverbal projects. Different like you know, ways uh, based on how the child or the individual learns better. Um, modify directions accordingly. Uh, avoid more than one test on the same day if that individual is a student. Uh, provide adequate notice for testing. Avoid scantrons because then, you know, if you have visual special problems, the scantrons are a no-no for someone who has an F1 or an F2. Um, and assistive technology is very important to, to be provided based on the student or the individual's needs. 
So, um, and uh, you know, who can help? I uh, believe that like you know, everybody has to have a team around them, and um, if the person is a student, then the whole team needs to work, you know, with uh, the student and the parents. Uh, and if the individual is in a work environment, the same should be in place in order to make sure that the individual maximizes their potential. So I think that uh, that's about it. And uh, now I can be open to questions. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Kuvadeli. Uh, that was wonderful. I ha I do have um, I do have some questions for you. Um, people have have asked um, as soon as I bring some of these up. One uh, one of our audience members wanted you to address any problems adults with NF might face in the workplace, or should they just extrapolate um, the information you gave about children? Or are there special yeah. needs for adults? Okay, so what we see uh, in children could be like persist in adulthood, depending on how many or what accommodations that an individual has received during school or early like childhood. So um, it depends how they are able to compensate for what they um, they, they were experiencing uh, as children. Some individuals have more support than others. Uh, they have uh, better, you know, strategies in their pockets, let's say, or in their brains um, than others. So it would depend. So all the, the problems that we um, addressed uh, for the students could be actually uh, be experienced in a work environment. Um, in the best way to do like and see what are those problems would be again a neuropsychological evaluation and then a specific treatment plan at, at each developmental stage to address the different needs of the individual or the same needs. So it depends if they have compensated for, for them or not. Thank you. I have a, we got a lot of questions about testing. Right. And so I'd like to summarize some of them. Uh, one is, if you have a child with NF, what neuropsychological testing should always be done? Okay, so uh, a neuropsychological testing, um, first of all, someone who should have experience with NF, that's the number one. So, you, you know, the individual should also always ask if that individual who is going to be doing the testing is experiencing an NF. Now, when we are doing the administer like a neuropsychological, and we are, you know, having a neuropsychological evaluation, we have to test the different areas of the brain, regardless. So, you know, you may think that the child has visual spatial difficulties only, but unless you are testing also the other areas, you cannot see what they have or not. So what I would suggest is to have a comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation that will test, like you know, the IQ, like the sensory motor functions, IQ, it will be attention, it will be memory, it will be executive functions, and we do not forget the psychological part of uh, the, the whole situation because individuals may have also in, uh, difficulties with adjusting with a chronic illness, and they may have uh, depression, they may have anxiety, so those issues need to be addressed also. So it's not only about cognitive functioning, but it's also about emotional functioning. So it has to be a comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation. Excellent. Are any of the tests risky to the patient? No. Okay. That was easy. Okay. Um, here's a harder one. Uh, do you happen to know if insurance covers any neuropsychological testing? Absolutely. It is a neurological disorder you know, considered, like if you have neuropsychological issues. So, yes, it is, it is covered by insurance. It's a medical disorder. As long as it's, it is medical disorder, it is covered by insurance. If you, if you go in and you say we have, like, you know, learning problems, and you do not disclose the fact that the child or individual has a, neuro, a neurofibromatosis, it may not get paid. But if 
as long as you say there is neurofibromatosis, they, the insurance companies are very much aware that uh, you know a neuropsychological evaluation is necessary. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and I am getting a lot of questions about your slides and the presentation, and I. I will give instructions at the very end, but I want to reiterate that the entire presentation and uh, Dr. Kuvadeli's slides, if she doesn't mind releasing them to me, will also be available in, in their entirety. The entire presentation will be available on our website and on YouTube starting probably later today, but by tomorrow for certain. Uh, I will get you information in one moment. But a final question, what percentage of NF children have no psycho, I, I beg your pardon, have no neuropsychological deficits whatsoever? Around 30 percent. Interesting. Now, if you will indulge me one more moment, I am going to um, Once again, say that we want to, um, I'm sure you agree, we want to thank Dr. Barbara Cuvidelli for sharing this important information. We also want to thank you all for joining us again by tomorrow, December 8, 2012. This session will be available for viewing in its entirety. You can view the slides and audio two ways, on our website, at www.nfmidatlantic.org. It is right on our homepage or at our YouTube channel, Great Gabby Dog. On both, in both those places, our website and Great Gabby Dog, you, are, you can view and listen to archived webinars. Before we close, I'd like to remind everyone, again, that NF Mid-Atlantic survives solely on your donation. If you appreciate these educational webinars and you want them to remain free, please consider a donation in any amount. It is our annual fund. You may do so at www.nfmidatlantic.org. We are a tax-exempt 501c3 nonprofit organization and we've made donating very easy. Again, we will soon be announcing the entire slate of new webinars for 2013 and as Dr. Kuvadeli and I discussed prior to this inter prior to this webinar. It will probably include another Dr. Kuvadeli special. If you have a special concern, please email us. In order to make sure you're informed of our schedule, please make sure you're on our our mailing list. You can sign up at the same place at our website at www.nfmidatlantic.org. Again, I want to thank you. We will be posting this later today. I, I want to give a virtual applause to Dr. Barbara Cuvadelli. I will post her slides and I will post her contact information. She is in both Edison, New Jersey and New York City and you or your child can make you can make an appointment for you, your child or someone else with NF. I thank you and hope that you all have a pleasant day. Thank you very much. Goodbye.